Jesus came to remind us that we have choices. We can choose to rejoice and celebrate the many ways in which we can serve and love others, or we can choose to moan and weep about our lot in life. We can keep everything we have and hoard and hold on to our trinkets of life, or we can share. That's what it's all about. God shares God's best with us, and we are called to share our best with others. Jesus came that we might have life abundantly and to share that abundance with others. Praise be to God. Welcome this day as we come to worship. We gather to share in our love of God. Lord, open our hearts and let us share your good news. We gather to share our witness to God's goodness. Lord, let our lives bear witness through service to your people. We gather to praise God whose love is eternal. Lord, open our hearts today to sing your praises. Amen. Pray with me. Lord, as we gather here on this day of sharing, remind us that you have shared with us your most precious gift, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to model our lives after his messages of compassion and service to you and to all your world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Officer Tori Mathis of the Southern California Humane Society got in an emergency call. A boy's pet iguana had been scared up a tree by a neighbor's dog and then it fell like a brick into the swimming pool and sank. Officer Matthew came, uh, came with her net. She dived in the pool, emerging seconds later with the pet limp spot, uh, pet's limp body. Well, you do CPR on a person and a dog, she thought to herself. Why not an iguana? So she put her lips to the iguana. Now that I look back on it, she says, it was pretty ugly animal to be kissing. But the last thing I wanted to do was tell that little boy that his iguana had died. The lizard responded to her efforts and was expected to make a full recovery. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I'd have a pretty difficult time putting my mouth on an iguana. She went beyond the call of duty, I think. In Ephesians 2.4, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at, at Ephesus, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. 
God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. To relate to St. Paul's story to the officer Tori Mathis, we might say that in Jesus Christ, God has resurrected an iguana, and we are the iguana. While we were still dead, Paul says, while we are, were ugly, while we were not worthy, God reached out with love and forgiveness and life. Now, maybe you don't enjoy being compared to an iguana. Maybe you might prefer this story by Max Lucado. He tells it in a book called Gentle Thunder. A friend of Lucado's named Kenny had just returned from a family trip to Disney World. I saw a sight I will never forget, Kenny said. I want you to know about it. He and his family were outside of Cinderella's castle and it was packed with kids and parents. Suddenly all the children rushed to one side as if it had been a boat, it would have probably turned over. Cinderella had entered. Cinderella, the pristine princess, Kenny and said she was perfectly tight a gorgeous young girl with each hair in place, flawless skin, and a beaming smile. She stood waist deep in that garden of kids, each wanting to be touched, wanting to touch her and to be touched. For some reason, Kenny turned and looked toward the other side of the castle. It was now vacant because there, and there was just one boy there, maybe seven or eight years old. His age was a little hard to determine because he had some disfigurement, dwarfed in height, face deformed. He stood watching quietly and wistfully, holding the hand of an older brother. Don't you know that he, what he wanted, Lucado asked. He wanted to be with the other children. He longed to be in the middle of the kids, reaching for Cinderella, calling her name. Can't you also feel his fear? Fear of yet another rejection. Fear of being taunted again, mocked again. Don't you wish Cinderella would go to him? I guess what? She did. She noticed that little boy. She immediately began walking in his direction, politely but firmly inching her way through that crowd of children. She finally broke free. She walked quickly across the floor, knelt at eye level with that stunned little boy and placed a kiss on his cheek. What a story of love and grace. For by grace we have been saved, and it is not of your own doing, but a gift of God. Not the result of works so that anyone would boast, says St. Paul. Nothing you or I can do to deserve or get God's grace, God's love, God's life. It's there because God gives it freely. Art Linklater, in a segment of his TV show, Kids Say the Darndest Things, was once interviewed by a little, interviewed a little girl about six or seven, and he asked her, what does love look like? And the little girl answered, it's when, like when I, I get, let Johnny get in the front of me at the drinking fountain line. Art Linklater said, well, you must love Johnny very much. But the little girl responded, no, I, I don't even like him. <laughs> Is 
that what love looks like? I think it is. God loves us even when we might not be like it. What amazing grace. But Paul doesn't stop there. He writes, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before us to be our way of life. We have been freed of sin and guilt so that our lives might be filled with good works. We are to be good people doing good things, not to win God's grace, but because of God's grace. In response to the wonderful gift of God, we respond by doing good things. Things that we know God wants us to do. Later in his the same epistle, Paul asked followers of Christ to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you have received. It's like a small town in France, which hid Jewish people from the Nazis during World War II. Phil Paley, an investigative reporter, went to this town to see what would make these people risk everything to do something so extraordinary. He interviewed people in the town and was overwhelmed about by how ordinary they were. They weren't the heroic types, nor were they especially intellectual or, or even politically enlightened. He did learn one thing from his interviews. The people of the town regularly attended church on Sunday. Week after week, their pastor proclaimed the love of God. They prayed and read the Bible together. Over time, by habit, they, they knew what was right and sought to do it. When the time came for them to be courageous, the day when the Nazis came to town hunting the Jews, they quietly did what was right. One elderly woman faked a heart attack when the Nazis came to search her house for a family of Jews hiding in her basement. She said, the pastor always taught us that there would come a time in every life when a person was asked to do something for Jesus. And when our time came, we knew what to do. What a witness of God's grace. It is a simple acknowledgement that we are given grace and we are to respond to that grace with what we have and what we can do. To reach out in love. It's like a monumental study that was done by Gordon Allport. Allport, I think his name is. He was a Harvard psychologist. Allport studied the nature of religious behavior and its relationship to bigotry and prejudice. He found that a lot of churchgoers of, of whatever religion were what he came to describe as in, ex, extrinsically religious. As he describes it, the extrinsically religious person uses religion. Going to church for extrins extrinsically religious person is useful to boost one's status, to bolster one's self-confidence, to win friends, to gain power, to, to have influence. Allport found that these people use their religious belief as a defense against reality. Most often they use it as a a sanction of their own formula of living. They, this kind of religious faith assures people that God sees things the way they see it. That their religious righteousness is God's righteousness. According to Allport, the extrinsically religious person turns to God, but does not turn away himself. Thus, religion is primarily a shield for self-centeredness or serving one's 
deep need for security and status and esteem. All ports empirically empirical tests showed that the extremely religious tended to be prejudiced and bigoted. And that this was true regardless of their religious persuasion. But Alport also found another group of people in church. He called them the intrinsically religious. According to Alport, these people had a deeply internalized religious faith and were totally committed to it. Their love of God was integral to all, all encompassing. It, it, is, it was an open faith with room for scientific and emotional facts. Intrinsically religious faith is a hunger for and committed to oneness with God and all others. The intrinsically religious have little prejudice or bigotry. They practice what they preach and evidence a striking humility. Good works are to be a way of life for us. We're not here to use God. We are here to be used by God. That's exactly the kind of faith experience that I think Paul is calling us to when he tells us to be conscious of what he calls the rich mercy of God. So that in all that we do, we live out our gratitude of service. We have been given the grace. God's grace comes to us and we are to live our lives in such a way that that grace is given expression. We are here right now because of God's grace. Some people think that service has to be done in some far off place or in some grand manner. Christian service starts with our own family, our own community, even our own friends. Leo Tolstoy, the world-class novelist and, and a Christian of, of strong principles, freed his serfs so that they would no longer live in grinding poverty. But Tolstoy overlooked the person right next to him. After he died, his wife Sonia wrote this. There is little genuine warmth about him. His biographies will tell of how he helped the laborers to carry buckets of water, but no one will ever know that he never gave his wife a rest and never in all these 32 years gave his child a drink of water or spent five minutes by his bedside to give him a chance, give me a chance to rest a little from all my labors. Tolstoy may have been a great Christian in so many ways, but he was blind to the needs of those closest to him. How tragic it is when we divorce our Christian life from our daily life. Daily life is what the gospel is about. It is serving Christ in the little things, how we treat people in our own family or on the job. It is the kind word here or there, the encouraging pat on the back, the willingness to listen to a friend pour out their heart. These small acts of service are far, have far more weight than anything else we can do. We must begin with those daily critical signs of faith in our lives. The late Mother Teresa was awarded the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize because because of her unselfish ministry to thousands of hungry, sick, and dying people in India. She wrote a book that offers excellent ideas about 
service to the Lord. Do not imagine, says Mother Teresa, that love to be true must be extraordinary. See how a lamp burns by the continual consumption of the little drops of oil. If there are no more of these little drops in our lamp, then there is no more light. And the bridegroom has a right to say, I do not know you. My children, what are these little drops of oil in our lamps? They are the lamps of everyday life. Fidelity, punctuality, little words of kindness, just a little thought for others, these acts of silence, of look and thought, of word and deed. These are the very drops of love that make our religious life burn with so much light. Do not search for Jesus in far off land, she concludes. He's not there. He is in you. Just keep the lamp burning and you will always see him. And I would add that he is also in every person that we meet. You and I are saved by grace for good works. Big works, eh, maybe. But usually for small loving acts of kindness to those closest to us. God resuscitated an iguana. Now it's the iguana's turn to reach out in love and kindness to someone else. Amen. Let's pray. Help us live out our faith and our life and our love for you every day, O oh God, in little ways, in big ways where we can, but especially in the everyday acts of kindness and love that you call us to. In Jesus' name.